Welcome to the first in our two-part series on The Big Mac Mystery. In this series, we're going to discuss the strange and interesting world of Ethernet Macs. In the first part, we're going to look at characterizing the features of an Ethernet Mac, and we're going to use these features to derive a robust measurement methodology for measuring the performance of Ethernet Macs in the second part. The fundamental question that we're looking to answer in this first part is what is an Ethernet Mac? Looking back historically, a Mac was defined as a medium access controller, although this definition leaves one key word out that would help to make it make sense in the historical context. This word is shared, that is a shared medium access controller. Historically, Ethernet networks were built using a shared medium, typically a coaxial cable over a BNC connector. It was the responsibility of the Ethernet Mac to control access to this shared medium. Having said that, modern Ethernet networks are not built this way and do not use shared mediums anymore. We now use these incredibly high-performance, high-density learning switches, which are connected using full-duplex copper and full-duplex fiber connections. So the obvious question then is, what does a modern Mac do? The easiest way to understand this is to look at an Ethernet frame. Typically, an Ethernet frame would contain a destination address, a source address, an ether type and some kind of payload. Enclosing that would then be the frame check sequence or CRC. This is a very software centric view of what an ethernet frame does. So we're going to dig in a little bit deeper, ignoring most of the software aspects to understand what the hardware view of an ethernet frame is. From the hardware view, there is a little bit more to it. There is a start of frame delimiter and a preamble and encapsulating each frame is a interframe gap. These components are the key responsibilities of an Ethernet Mac. So the core functions of an Ethernet Mac then are, first, to enforce the interframe gap, which is the minimum time in between frames. Secondly, to issue the preamble and start of frame delimiter when sending frames and to strip them when receiving frames. And finally, to calculate or check the CRC when sending or receiving frames. To understand the Ethernet Mac a little bit more, we're going to need to understand the various layers of how it goes together, and I'm going to use the Ethernet layer cake as my running example. So at the top layer here, we have the Ethernet Mac that we've discussed so far, and at the very bottom layer, we have the wire or the fiber on which we're going to wiggle electrons or photons to move data. To understand the components in the middle, we're going to need to look at some of the details of data transmission. First, we're going to look at low-speed data transmission, and then we'll use that to understand how data transmission has evolved into high-speed systems. In a low-speed system, there is a clock signal, which is a regular source of pulses that is used to sample some kind of a data signal. When we sample that data signal, we arrive at the stream of bits that we are trying to transmit over the wire. As you can see here, we have two parallel transmission path lines one for the data and one for the clock. In a high-speed system, it's not possible to keep these two parallel paths in synchronization with each other. So what we do is we take the data signal and we use it to infer where the clock ticks may have happened by looking at transitions between 0 and 1. We can then guess that other clock ticks happened in the intermediate period and we can recover the clock from our data signal and again use it to sample and get our data stream. If we put this process in the context of our Ethernet layer cake, we can see that the data stream is more closely associated with the MAC level of the layer cake, while the clocking stream is more closely associated with the wire layer of the layer cake. In this case, we call this new layer in between the physical coding sublayer, or PCS. The PCS has three core functions. The first is to maintain clock synchronization when there is no data, which is we need to make sure that there are a number of zero to one transitions happening even when we are not sending data. The second is to encode data to ensure that there is a good spread of one and zeros so that we get lots of transitions while we're moving data and then we can still recover our clock. Finally, we need to distinguish between these two cases by encoding data into some sort of transmission blocks that have start of frame and end of frame delimiters. If we look closely, we can see that all of the core functions of the PCS layer have to do with encoding. 
10 gigabit Ethernet uses the 64B, 66B encoding scheme, otherwise known as 6466. In a 6466 encoding, we take our stream of ones and zeros on the wire, and we break them into blocks of 66 bits. We then further break these blocks into blocks of 64 bits and two header bits. The header bits are used to describe the state of the 6466 block. When these header bits are 00 or 11, the block is assumed to have been in error. When the header bit is 01, it is assumed that there is data inside of the block. And when the header bit is 10, there is assumed to be some sort of control in the block. Typically, the control marks the start of frame, end of frame, or an idle symbol. If you've been paying attention so far, you may have noticed that we have two different types of start of frames. Firstly, we have the PCS layer start of frame, and secondly, we have the Mac layer start of frame. For the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to call the PCS layer start of frame the early start of frame, and the Mac layer start of frame simply the start of frame. Looking again at our Ethernet layer cake, there is one more layer that we have yet to describe. The easiest way to understand this layer is to start by asking a question. And the question is, how do you run your FPGA logic at 10 GHz? And the simple answer is that you don't. The final layer in our layer cake is the Physical Medium Attachment Layer, or PMA. The job of the PMA is to take our 1 bit at 10 GHz signal and to slow it down into a wider and slower path. For example, what we might want to do is to transmit our data at 64 bits at a time at 161 MHz, and this is much easier to do inside of an FPGA. So with that, we now have all of the components of our Ethernet layer cake. Starting at the bottom, we have the wire or medium in which we wiggle photons or electrons to move bits. We go up through the physical medium attachment layer where we do speed conversions from 10 gigahertz into a slower speed that can be run inside of an FPGA. We then have our encoding and decoding layer, the physical coding sublayer, and finally the Mac layer that understands actual packets and so on. This concludes our discussion of the Ethernet Mac. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion and that you'll join us for part two, where we discuss the question of how to measure the performance of an Ethernet Mac. In part two, we'll take our understanding of an Ethernet Mac and use it to develop a robust methodology for measuring the latency performance of high-performance Ethernet Macs. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. My name is Dr. Matthew Grosvenor, and I've been speaking on behalf of the team at Exablaze.